Hey everyone, welcome back. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more about um, uh, neurons and how they work, and really now we're going to focus in on some neurotransmitters um, and basically give you just a, a, a very, I don't know, I guess broad overview of, of some of their functions. Right? These can get super, super specific. Um, there are entire disciplines, journals um, dedicated to each one of these. We're not going to get anywhere near that depth. Again, just very superficial level, just to give you an idea of some of their functions. Okay, so um, with that, let me just kind of give you a little bit of a, I don't know, tidbit kind of fun fact. Uh, what you're looking at, these are actual images taken uh, using microscopes. They're, they're actually using fluorescent microscopes uh, to take images of neurons in the brain. So what they've been able to do is actually use principles of the immune system, so antibodies, and they're able to tag very specific receptors on the, on the surface, or proteins I should say, on the surface of a uh, cell membrane of different neurons. So depending on the, on the cell that you are, you'll have slightly different proteins on the cell membrane. And they'll make antibodies, they'll color it a different color, so specific cells will light up a specific color. So you can see Basically, all the ones that are in green are one type, the ones in blue are one type. Red is a totally different protein, different fibers. So axons and dendrites will have different proteins expressed in them. So you can actually tell difference now um, between axons and dendrites, something that we couldn't do in our lab, right? It just all, they all look the same because our stain wasn't specific enough to label them differentially. You have the same kind of thing here. You can really see the axons and dendrites. Um, one is in red, the other is in, in green. And then here, what you're seeing um, is like this, this is actually a, an image, again, taken from a, a microscope. Um, and what you're seeing here is that depending on the age of the cell, they, it expresses a slightly different, they express different proteins. Um, and what they've been able to do is color code all these different proteins. So now you can know that all the greens were born at the same time, all the purples were born at the same time, all the yellows were born at the same time, and kind of where they've then ended up distributing themselves. Okay, so just, you know, I just thought that was kind of a neat little fun fact about where we've gotten with some imaging and what neurons kind of look like. All right, so let me hide me, or maybe I can just actually just move myself here. All right, so we had talked about neurotransmitters a little bit, right? So again, we had talked about acetylcholine when we talked about muscle contractions. And in the previous video, we talked about how uh, the neurotransmitters are released in, at the synaptic end bulb to get across that synaptic cleft so that, the so that the signal can get transmitted to the next neuron. All right, well, what do we do with that neurotransmitter that's just kind of floating around in that synaptic cleft? Well, some of that simply just diffuses away from the synaptic cleft. So you dumped it in a space, some of it just kind of, you know, wanders off and eventually gets cleaned up by some of the microglia and other phagocytes. There are also other enzymes that will help degrade uh, the different neurotransmitters, right? Um, so you've probably, um, have, maybe you've heard of some of them involving serotonin, for example. Um, you've actually seen one, an enzyme already, when we talked about muscles. You remember what that enzyme was? So we talked about acetylcholine, right? That was our neurotransmitter. So the enzyme that broke down acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft was acetylcholine esterase, okay? So it helped, again, kind of clear it from that synaptic cleft, allowed for more specific uh, signals sent to muscles. And then finally, some of that neurotransmitter is simply taken up by cells um, and recycled. So um, kind of like this little recycle bin truck right here. So another cell, um, usually an astrocyte, um, sometimes the cell itself, the, the presynaptic neuron, will simply take up any of the excess neurotransmitter, gives it back to that presynaptic neuron. That's about it. So you recycle them. Um, and you probably have heard of um, SSRIs, you may have heard of those. So, so those stand for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, so that would be an example of where we inhibit the reuptake of serotonin, um, and by inhibiting the reuptake, more serotonin stays in that synaptic cleft. So instead of having to give someone like a, a pill that contains it, we simply leave it in that synaptic cleft longer so it can do whatever it is going to do. Let's see. All right. 
So we have, we're going to talk about two different concepts. One is excitatory postsynaptic potentials and then inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. So in an excitatory postsynaptic potential, basically, let's just kind of read this. So a neurotransmitter that depolarizes the postsynaptic membrane is excitatory. Okay? So that's all that means. So here's our, uh, here's our presynaptic neuron. It releases the neurotransmitter to the synaptic cleft. It, you know, it impacts the, the postsynaptic uh, neuron, and it'll excite it. It'll depolarize it. So that means that if another signal comes in, it's more likely for this thing to fire. Okay? Does that hopefully make sense? So again, that, that, that postsynaptic potential is excitatory. Um, usually where we see these connections, because remember, neurons can make connections all over the place. Um, but basically, if you have the axon of one neuron contacting the dendrites of that postsynaptic neuron, that connection implies that it's going to be an excitatory signal. Okay, just the connection alone. Not always, but chances are that's what it's going to be. Okay, it's, I don't know, it's sort of like, it doesn't matter what car we get into, we assume that, you know, the clutch is, you know, way to the left, gas is way to the right. So we don't have... So basically the same kind of idea. We can always assume that depending where that connection is, it's going to be excitatory. Okay. All right. So in, and then on the other hand, so kind of going along with this car analogy, if we had something that caused the, you know, like, sort of like the, the accelerator, we're going to have to have a gas pedal. So we also have inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Okay. So in this case, a neurotransmitter will cause hyperpolarization. So meaning instead of getting closer to that negative 55 threshold, we go in the opposite direction. Maybe we go from negative 70 down to negative 80 or negative 90, right? So it'll cause hyperpolarization of that postsynaptic membrane. And because it's going away from that threshold, it's just that much harder to get that uh, postsynaptic uh, neuron to fire. So it's kind of like the brakes on the car, okay? Um, so again, it's just what I said here. So during hyperpolarization, the generation of an action potential is more difficult because that membrane is just that much further from the threshold. And then usually where we see that kind of happening is when the presynaptic neuron is making contact with the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron. Again, that's sort of where the breaks are. Okay. Um, and then ever so often, so this little note down at the bottom, ever so often you'll see the synapses of, uh, on axons, so axon to axon. That doesn't inhibit, that doesn't accelerate or you know excite. Um, basically, what that does is it simply modulates the amount of neurotransmitter being released. So this, you've already gotten the excitatory signal from somewhere else. This sort of tweaks and says, okay, and let's make that a little bit more, or let's make that a little bit less. Okay, that that's all that that is. So if it's making axon to dendrite, excitatory, axon to cell body, inhibitory. Axon to axon, it's going to modulate the signal. Okay. All right, I'm going to let's see, move myself here. Um, so basically, we're going to take this idea of excitatory postsynaptic potentials, right here, the e, it's abbreviated EPSP, and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, IPSP. I'm going to put that together. Okay. So basically, like you can see here, so neurons are going to when we, I know, I know when we looked at it in lab, it didn't look like a lot of connections, um, but for some reason it's a really weird thing, and they don't really understand why still to this day. When you stain something, you don't actually see all the neurons. We're getting better. So you saw like the images uh, that I showed you at the beginning of this presentation. We're getting better, so we actually are getting to see the majority, if not all of the, I'm going to say all, but the majority of the neurons now in the brain region. But in the past, we wouldn't, like about a tenth of them would stain. Anyway, that's what we saw in lab. However, a typical neuron in the central nervous system will contact, you know, or get contact from, I should say, you know, from 1,000 to 10,000 other synapses. I mean, that's a lot of connections, right? I mean, I don't know, that would be the equivalent of a ton of friends on social media, right, on whatever social media site that you're using, right? So, and as you can imagine, just like you getting input on that social media website from 1,000 to 10,000 individuals, that might influence how you react to something we go with this analogy. So let's just take a look here. So here we have our postsynaptic cell. 
It's in this sort of beigey color, right? And then we have presynaptic uh, neurons. So we see these like they're contacting the dendrite, 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 and then here we're a little bit more on the cell body, and you'll see this one is going to be inhibitory. So what ends up happening, right, is these are going to be excitatory. You see a little, it's going closer to threshold. So we're hyper, I'm sorry, we're depolarizing the cell membrane, depolarizing, depolarizing, hyperpolarizing, right? Now, we have two ways that this can then trigger an action potential in this postsynaptic cell, right? So one way is spatial summation, and that's really what you're seeing here. So, you know, this, this axon, you know, is telling this, this cell to, to excite, 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 inhibit. Well, that's three to one. It's probably going to excite, right? It's probably going to fire. So that's spatial summation. So in space, you have many things telling it to do one thing, and then, you know, fewer of the other telling it to do the other, right? Sort of like, I don't know, a hundred of your friends tell you to do something, and then two of them tell you not to, you're probably going to do it. Right, because you got the, the, the input is overwhelmingly toward doing it. Right, so similar to here. So as long as you get the excitatory postsynaptic potential, it'll take you closer to the threshold, closer to the threshold, closer to the threshold. One inhibitory, another threshold, you're going to hit it. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, temporal summation, on the other hand, is a little bit different. It isn't so much um, what well, isn't at all um, how many are coming in. So it isn't like a hundred to one kind of thing. Instead, what it is, is it's basically one neuron rapidly firing, going fire, 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 fire. So excitatory, 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 excitatory. So with that many incoming small excited postsynaptic potentials, you're going to eventually hit threshold. Okay. So, it's, so basically the difference is spatial summation. You have many coming in, um, sending their signal, and either this neuron, in this case, in, our, in the image here, it will fire right? Because you have more excitatory than you do inhibitory. In the case of temporal, it would be a one-to-one -one kind of thing. It's just that this one's going fire, 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 and then the postsynaptic goes, okay, I'll, I'll fire. I kind of think of it as, uh, I guess my analogy again, so spatial summation runs in that social media, again, that like a hundred friends telling you to do something, you know, one or two telling you not to, you're going to do it. Temporal summation is more like your significant other nagging you a hundred times to take out the garbage. It's just one person doing the nagging, but they do it enough, you're going to eventually take out the garbage. Okay? So that's sort of my analogy. All right. We have this guy, um, Donald Head. It's a really important key figure in neuroscience. Um, he came up with this tenant called Hebbian plasticity. And this is, in this second uh, bullet point is actually what he said. But in this third bullet point is what it means. And this is how everyone in neuroscience remembers it. Basically, it says neurons that fire together wire together. Right? And what that means is, is that if we have this neuron here, and it is constantly sending a signal to this neuron here, saying, hey, do it, you know, fire, 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 and this one's reacting to that, what ends up happening is eventually they'll build a much stronger connection between the two. Maybe you have several synaptic end bulbs from you know, this one making contact with this one, right? So the connection becomes stronger. Versus if this neuron, let's say we get another set of neurons, um, I don't know, pinkies, okay, <laughs> different set of neurons. So let's say we have this one and this one, they have a connection, this one's ever so often like fire, fire. It's not a very strong signaling, right? They don't really fire together. That connection will eventually go away, okay? Or it'll be weak. Okay, so again, um, the more that one neuron sends that signal to another, the stronger like their physical connection becomes to one, to one another. It makes sense. It's sort of again, let's use social media or just friendships. The more time you spend with someone, the closer friends you usually are, and that connection's gonna be really strong, right? And and that's similar to how our brains are. The more we study, the more we work at something, the more we practice, and that's gonna be really key. So the more you practice the more times those neurons are sending signals to one another, the more times they're connecting, that connection becomes really strong, right? So think about this, the stuff that you've practiced like over and over and over again, even if you don't do it for a while, you come back and that connection's still there, you still remember how to do it, right? Because you built up a nice strong connection. Versus if you only look at it once or you read it once or you do it once, 
You might remember it for a short time, but then that connection goes away because you never really solidified it. Hopefully that makes sense. So again, neurons that fire together, send signals to one another, are going to wire together. And again, this, the more they fire together, the more they influence one another, the stronger um, that, connect, that physical connection is going to be. Super key tenant in, in all of neuroscience. All right, so I'm going to hide me here so you can see this better. We're going to talk uh, mostly about neurotransmitters. Um, I just wanted to bring up the concept of a neuropeptide really briefly. Um, you may encounter these um, in your studies. And just so you know what these are, essentially they're going to be the same thing. So a neurotransmitter, so a neuropeptide is basically the same thing as a neurotransmitter. However, it's, it's a smaller protein molecule. That's all. So it's about 40 amino acids. That instead of like you know much larger molecules, otherwise pretty much the same behave pretty much the same. Okay, um, so we've seen neurotransmitters, right? So this is what's being released at that uh, synaptic end bulb, um, helping cross that synaptic cleft so that, that postsynaptic neuron can fire and, and continue that signal to wherever it's got to go. Right. So we're going to talk about just a couple of neuropeptides real fast. Um, not a lot of them. So here's substance, something called substance P. Um, so basically substance P, we know that one of its jobs is to enhance the perception of pain. So if you basically, if you block substance P, um, people report things not hurting as much or at all. Okay. Um, and, and kephalins and endorphins are basically in the same class. These things are, are endogenous morphine. So your body, let's see, so this term endorphin comes from endogenous morphine. It's a kind of a smash up of the words. Okay. Um, so basically what one of its main jobs is going to be to inhibit pain impulses. So when, when you get an endorphin rush, I mean, think about it, usually when you have an endorphin rush, what's going on is you're doing something that's really exciting, right? You're, you're, a part, you're, you're taking part of some sort of, I don't know, adventure or something. Um, that is not the time that you want to stop and feel pain, right? So a classic time you'd have an endorphin rush is, is, is during your fight or flight response, right? So either you got to fight off the zombies or run away from them. That is not the time that you care that you scratched your arm. And I'm sure you guys have all had that experience. You've done something, you're out doing something, and then you kind of like next day, you're like, oh man, how did I get that bruise? I didn't, I didn't hit, I don't remember hitting my arm. Because you don't, because these endorphins prevented you from paying attention to it, or caring about it, I should say. Um, that's part of it. Right? Um, they also will affect memory and learning. Um, endorphins are usually, uh, they'll sort of give you that kind of that high, right, that you don't, it's a very kind of pleasant feeling. So obviously, if something is very pleasant, it's gonna you're gonna want to do it again, right? I mean, this is, so basically, it'll affect memory and learning, right? On a positive, um, and then also it can it can also get to like a negative as well, where again you hit your arm, you don't remember why why or where or what happened. You're like, how did I get that bruise? You know, so it can it can affect memory two ways. At the very Low end, well, I should say, at, the, at some level, you remember, oh, that was a fun thing to do. I'm going to totally do that again. At the other end, you don't necessarily remember all the fine details. Okay. Um, these do help control part of your body temperature. Um, they're also released during sexual activity, so part of the things that makes that it so enjoyable. Um, and endorphins um, and, and kephalins have been linked to different mental illnesses and we're going to see this over and over again um, that if you have too high a level of any of these neuropeptides or neurotransmitters or too low a level it ends up causing different mental illnesses and there how can I put this um, it, it we'll see that different mental illnesses will have many different causes okay so the the end result may be the same but the, you can have many different causes. This is why sometimes it's so hard to treat because you don't really know what the underlying cause is. It could be an imbalance in this, it could be an imbalance in that, and you could be an imbalance in this. And there's really no good way to detect it. 
the best thing that doctors can usually do is prescribe a number of different drugs and hopefully one of those will work. And then they can go, oh, okay, it was due to this. Um, another example of a neuropeptide is going to be CCK, cholecystokinin. You'll see this guy a lot when we get to 202. Um, so it's found in the brain and in the small intestine. It's going to be one of the, it's going to be your stop eating signal. It, and it'll also regulate enzymes and contractions um, of the gallbladder. So that's part of the digestive function that it has. Again, you'll end up talking quite a bit about it in 202 as far as how it regulates uh, secretions and then contractions of the bladder. So just for right now, just be aware of, you know, what it is. All right. So neurotransmitter-wise, um, we have a couple of different categories. We have amino acids, and then we have something called monoamines. Um, so you can kind of see here are just some examples of amino acids and then monoamines. So we're going to talk a little bit about each one of these and some of their functions and what diseases they've been implicated in. Again, very superficially. So I guess I'll bring me back so you can kind of see me um, and my awesome hair. Um, anyway, so glutamate, one of the key things I want you to understand is glutamate is going to be the main excitatory neurotransmitter vertebrates. That's key. Okay. Pretty much this is the gas uh, in, it's, it's the gas in the car, I guess, a gas pedal in the car. Uh, so, so whenever you release glutamate, it will excite the postsynaptic neuron. Okay. Always. Always. Um, glutamate receptors, um, we have three different classes of them. One is called NMDA, the other is AMPA, the other is Kinate. When you have um, dysregulations in this receptor, uh, we've, what ends up happening is that people end up showing signs of schizophrenia. Yet not all cases of schizophrenia are due to this. However, it is one, one of the causes of it. Okay? So again, if this receptor is somehow malfunctioning, the brain, again, the, the electrical signals are off, so you, you get sort of schizophrenic-like uh, responses from that. Okay. These AMPA receptors, they are going to generate very fast excitatory postsynaptic potentials, so that's kind of a, a key thing, so it's really important that they are going to be able to elicit um, that postsynaptic neuron to fire very quickly. And then when these canate receptors are somehow faulty, um, a lot of times that's linked to epilepsy. You can sometimes think of epilepsy as sort of like an electrical storm in the brain. So you can imagine that if the receptor for the basically the, the main excitatory neurotransmitter is malfunctioning, that causes that sets off an electrical storm. Neurons are fine when they shouldn't be, um, and then you, you basically end up having like the ep epileptic seizures or visions or disorientation that people have. Okay. Um, don't, do not fear this slide. <laughs> you will not be asked this. I just wanted to show you that, so this is how complicated it actually gets. Okay. It is way complicated. There's so many other little molecular biology um, molecules really working together to, to show you what the symptoms are and like what the effects are. Um, even in vesicle transport, you can see there's a lot of things going on. So when we talk about very simplistic levels, this is why, because it gets crazy busy um, once you really delve into it. Um, maybe one of you guys will want to do that at some point. Um, it, it does get kind of interesting, and really when we talk about a lot of the drugs, what they're trying to do is affect it at these um, very small molecular level so you can have very specific effects. But that's for another day. All right. GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid is going to be our main inhibitory neurotransmitter. So if glutamate was the gas, GABA is the brakes. So again, it's important regulating neuron firing. Now I know most of the time we, we, we talk about wanting things to go, we don't like things to necessarily stop. But just like in your car, you can't always just hit the gas pedal. Sometimes you have to stop, right? If the situation's warranted. Um, and as I mentioned, like irregulations, if you're firing too much or inappropriately, you can get things like schizophrenia or epilepsy, right? So having a break is really important. The class of drugs that enhance the activity of GABA are called benzodiazepines, right? So one of the main class of drugs. So Valium, Xanax, Halcyon, these are all benzodiazepines that category of drug. Um, and one of the things that makes them very, uh, I guess, dangerous, really, 
is when people are prescribed them chronically because basically the body is very good at going, well, hey, I got plenty because you're taking it in that pill form. So the brain stops making it itself. So basically the brain, the brain goes, why do I have brakes in the car? I don't need this. This is just dead weight. I got plenty of stopping power. It's artificial stopping power, right? So as the brain gets rid of the brakes, if you all of a sudden take the go cold turkey off these, what ends up happening is you end up having seizures and possibly um, death, actually, because you've taken away the brakes of the car. Because the, the brain can't compensate for that quickly enough. That's why usually if someone's on certain some drugs, they'll usually taper them off, you know, give you lower, lower doses. That allows the body to kind of catch up and bring its own uh, manufacture of that back to whatever it was at baseline levels. Hopefully that makes sense. Hide me here. Another neurotransmitter is going to be norepinephrine. It's produced by a brain region called the locus ceruleus, also by your adrenal glands. Another name for norepinephrine is noradrenaline. Um, so, but we, we tend to call it norepinephrine in neuroscience. Um, the locus ceruleus in the brain has projections to many other brain regions. So what it ends up doing is that it helps increase vigilance and arousal in other brain regions. So it helps not just wake you up, but also helps you pay attention. And if levels get too high, you, you no longer can pay attention. Now you're, you're kind of like, you know, you're just not focused. You're looking at this and all of a sudden this and then this and this and this and this, right? Which when we think about it is, is really important evolutionarily. Because think about this. At some level, you have to have, let's just say, let's say, let's say you're out in real life, you're out in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of nature, and I don't know, you're going to go pick berries or flowers or something, right? So you're trying to pay attention to this specific berry or flower, whatever it is you're picking, right? So you're focused, right? Your, your norepinephrine levels are at nice optimal levels, you're focused, you're looking for these flowers. All of a sudden, you hear a whole bunch of twigs crunching, you hear a moan that sounds like a zombie, well, holy cow, your norepinephrine levels are going to go through the roof, right? And what is your natural response going to be? You're going to be like, where, where, who, what, where, what? And you're looking all over the place. You do not care about those flowers and or berries anymore. You, it's going to, you're going to have a very hard time even going back to that action, about being able to focus back on that task, right? Because you're so worried about what's going on over there, over there, over there. And now you hear another sound or you think you see something. I mean, you're going to be like, what? Which is important because you know if it really was a zombie attack you want to be able to quickly respond to that right unfortunately in our everyday lives what ends up happening with people who have anxiety and stuff like that um, another kind of mood disorders is that you know zombies don't attack us really in, in our in our world so the inability to focus on tasks at hand is now a detriment whereas at one point it was a benefit to our survival you know in our office type workplace it's no longer um, something that benefits us. Okay. Um, another classic neurotransmitter you guys have probably heard of is something called serotonin. Um, again, serotonin is implicated in a lot of different uh, mental illnesses, some depression, anxiety, um, food intake, um, and you probably can guess this, like, you know, if people are depressed or anxious, that definitely affects how they how they eat, right? And depending on the individual, either they can eat, you know, I'm sure we've all been so nervous that we couldn't eat, right, at one point, um, or they're depressed and they don't want to eat, so it depends. Um, or sometimes some people, it's the exact opposite, right? They'll want to eat even more. So it just, it just depends on the individual. Um, dopamine, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into the brain. One of the important things is that it helps regulate motor behavior. Um, so so uh, when you lose the neurons that make dopamine, um, one of the things you end up with is Parkinson's disease. Okay? And usually um, when people have Parkinson's disease, they'll try to give them something called L-DOPA. That is, a, that is a, a drug. It's a precursor to dopamine. So the body can easily convert this L-DOPA into dopamine. Um, and by that, you know, increase again the levels of dopamine in the brain to get rid of those Parkinson-like symptoms. This works for a while, but as the disease progresses, um, it's not enough. And you may have to have other uh, remedies for it.
Okay. Um, and then other dopamine pathways are thought to regulate motivated behavior. So part of that whole depression thing where you don't feel like doing anything anymore, like you're like, no, I don't like, I don't want to. And you're like, you know, why don't you want to go out? You used to love picking flowers. I don't know. Um, and now you don't want to is because sometimes dopamine is also uh, implicated in, in sort of mood uh, disorders as well. Okay. Um, and also dopamine pathways, when these are not functioning correctly, one of the other things has been shown is that some schizophrenics um, actually have these, their dopamine pathways are malfunctioning. And again, so here's another potential cause for schizophrenia. So very different from the one we saw before. Okay. Um, you probably, you all know what ADHD is, right? Attention Deficit Hy Hyperactive Disorder. Um, interestingly, all of the drugs for depression are somehow going to increase the norepinephrine or dopamine levels, right? Um, amphetamine also increases norepinephrine, dopamine, as well as serotonin levels. So what's kind of weird as far as that goes is I mentioned to you guys before that um, norepinephrine, right, if we have too much of it, you go from that nice focused picking berries uh, flowers thing to scanning for zombies, right, if it's too high. But interestingly, if we increase the levels even more, get past that, you go back to being focused. And, and in all honesty, people don't know why. They don't really understand exactly why that works. They just know it does. So you get Ritalin and stuff like that. Um, which is, in all honesty, a lot of how some of these drugs are prescribed. They don't exactly know how it works. They just know it does work. They don't, there don't seem to be, I can put this, the side effects seem less severe than the problem itself. So they get prescribed, but they don't actually know exactly how it works. Um, same thing with depression. Um, a lot of these drugs, oops, let's go back. A lot of these drugs uh, are going to increase serotonin and norepinephrine levels. So in some of these, uh, what they're doing is they're inhibiting the reuptake of either serotonin um, and or norepinephrine. So again, if you inhibit the reuptake, the more that is left in that synaptic cleft. Okay. There are many other theories for depression, so it's not just um, lack of serotonin, norepinephrine levels, um, but these are sort of one of the most commonly, I guess, med ways, to, ways that people medicate or try to help depression via medications is by, by uh, targeting serotonin and norepinephrine levels. Okay. Um, I also just want to talk to you a little bit about neurogenesis. So neurogenesis is, as the name implies, um, like genesis is like growth, like the beginning, first growth, um, and then of neurons. So it's the growth of new neurons. Um, and the idea of neurogenesis in, human, in adult humans um, was discovered by by her, by Liz Gould. She's a professor at Princeton University. Um, and so basically she discovered that we do in fact have new neuron growth in at least two of our brain regions. And this, and she discovered this somewhere in the mid-90s, so you know about 20 years ago now. I guess it's 20 years ago. Yeah, 20 years ago now. Um, and this was a very big deal because it had been stuck in the literature that once you're an adult, that's it, your brain is set, and you have what neurons you have, and once they die, they're dead. Um, but she's shown that that's not necessarily true. Um, come on. So basically what we see, where we see it is in um, the hippocampus and in the olfactory bulb. So here's the old hippocampus. Um, the hippocampus is important in learning and memory. Uh, in, in, uh, in depression, we see that if the hippocampus is... Um, small for some reason, like it's shrunk. Um, people tend to exhibit depression. Some people with very small hippocampuses um, also may, some of them have shown uh, symptoms of PTSD, right? So clearly proper new neuron growth is going to be really important in learning memory, depression, PTSD. Plus, if we can figure out how new neurons grow, we can find out a way to heal damaged brain areas. Um, the olfactory bulb is going to be much more, I think, obvious to us. I mean, obviously, when you smell things, a lot of times, you, I mean, you can imagine how you can, like, damage uh, that area. Um, so you just have constant rep, uh, replacement of cells there, right, just from, you know, very strong smells, I guess. 
Um, and we'll talk more about, just kind of keep this individual sort of in the, in the back of your mind. We're going to talk more about um, this individual named, called H.M. In the, in the psychology literature. He was incredibly key to our understanding of how learning and memory actually works. So just very quickly, some other diseases relating back to neurons. Um, you may have heard of multiple sclerosis. Basically what happens is that myelin sheath surrounding the neurons in the central nervous system starts to degenerate. It's an autoimmune disease, meaning that your own immune system attacks um, the cells producing the myelin sheath, so it attacks the oligodendrocytes. Um, and basically it gets its name because the myelin sheath degenerates in multiple areas into plaques called sclerosis. So that's how you get that. And then obviously as that myelin sheath degenerates, it'll affect proper neuron firing, which then affects function both in thought as well as muscle movements. Um, seizures and epilepsy, again, it's really, you can kind of think of it as uh, an electrical storm in the brain. Uh, and again, it may or may not incorporate muscle spasms. So I think for most of us, an epileptic seizure is kind of when you see someone like really shaking and, and um, you know, kind of falling to the ground. It doesn't always mean that. Um, we'll talk more about brain regions in after this exam, uh, and and you'll you'll find out that depending if you have a let me put this way, if you have a, a, a an electrical storm in the region of the brain that's responsible for you interpreting sounds, you may have auditory hallucinations. If you have an electrical storm in the part that's res of the brain that's responsible for vision, you might either see things or you're unable to interpret that which you see. So things like that. And it, so it may not have anything to do with any kind of muscle spasms. Okay. Um, and then things like rabies, right? So rabies is a virus. It's small. It can get across that blood-brain barrier. And basically what ends up happening is it causes inflammation in the brain. You have inflammation in the brain that crushes neurons. You crush neurons. You, you kind of, you know, you've, you've heard of rabbit animals. They don't act right. They don't walk right. They're frothing at the mouth, all sorts of other things. Because, you know, if you're crushing neurons, you can't function well. You're not thinking right. So behavior is going to be very bizarre until finally the animal just dies. So hopefully that made sense to you guys. I know this is a bit of a longer lecture, and I'm sorry. I, I usually try to keep these under 20 minutes. Um, this is kind of like double time. Um, but uh, I, was, I, was, I think they all it kind of the topics went together, so I didn't want to separate them. Um, anyway, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, feel free to email me as always, and I will do my best to answer your questions. All right? See you next time.